Warren, Fernando, welcome to the show. Thanks, Hi, Matt. Appreciate you having us. Uh, happy to be here. We have a rare double interview. Where are you guys uh, located? Where, where does it find you in late April 2021? Uh, I am in Sarasota, Florida uh, on the Gulf Coast. I'm in the San Francisco Bay Area in Moraga. Sweet. Well, gentlemen, uh, first of all, congratulations on your new venture, 314 Research. Uh, I'm excited to uh, follow along with your research and the work you guys have been putting out for a while. What was the inspiration? Why did you decide to go start your own shop? One of the hardest things a human being can do in the world, be an entrepreneur. What gave you that good confidence? And uh, tell me the origin story, how you guys teamed up. Origin story. Uh, where do I begin here? Um, well, we, uh, this is Warren, we, I started uh, my career as an attorney for the natural resources industry and then uh, really always had a passion for the markets and uh, didn't, didn't have the traditional route though. And I had, uh, I was working in the, uh, in central Florida and had identified uh, a few of the, sh the shops. This was more than a decade ago that I would be interested in um, trying to kind of carve out a career in, in finance. And Ned Davis Research was, was in my backyard and I respected their work and the way they approached markets in general. And uh, as luck would have it, um, I was able to, to connect with the, the head of the commodities team over there, John LaForge, who's now doing um, head of real assets at Wells Fargo. And uh, I hounded him for a, a period of time. And I think he was skeptical about bringing me on. But uh, eventually he, he, he gave me an interview and you know the rest is kind of history from there as far as NDR is concerned. But when I got to NDR, um, Fernando was there and he can kind of talk about his path. But uh, he was in the custom department and, and I was on the commodity team. My path eventually was to take over the energy space at Ned Davis Research, uh, oil, energy, all that stuff, the entire complex, and then to eventually take over the entire commodity team. So, um, but to, to take a step back, as far as how did Fernando and I start working together back in 2013, I think you might recall this, Matt, you and I had met at a conference around this time. I did the first ever report from it, uh, Ned Davis Research on uh, the master limited partnership space, you know, pipelines, MLPs and all that. And no one had ever touched that topic at NDR before. And I needed, the, the data was a mess. Actually, we didn't have the data in house. So we had to kind of, I wanted to do like a true factor analysis of MLPs in, in that space. And so I went to uh, the custom department and really the, the, the best person there was Fernando. And he, he, he helped me with that study. That was the first time we'd done and touched the space at NDR, the editor of Barron's liked it a lot and ended up inviting me to the MLP roundtable just based off that one report, which was really a factor breakdown of MLPs. So that started, I'd say, Fernando and my working relationship. And, and we really clicked well. We worked together well from the get-go. And that was back in 2013, so a long time ago. We kind of, you know, obviously we we're friends and we, we, we traveled along different paths, but constantly stayed in contact and worked together while we were at NDR. For me, after I took over the commodity space and had kind of carved out the, my area there in you know, the pandemic hit and at NDR, they decided that uh, they wanted to get rid of uh, the dedicated commodity research and the separate commodity team. And that was in a casualty of 2020. And, and by then, in, in a strange way, I think that was kind of a nice contrarian <laughs> signal that, you know, as shops were chopping their commodity teams and chopping their, their traditional energy coverage and things like that. Uh, you know, I just think it's, it, for the most part, I want to follow trends in investing, but here I wanted to, you know, make a contrarian move and say, you know, I think that the next 40 years are unlikely to look like the last 40 years. And I think that this real asset space uh, is going to be a really unnecessary component to a, a broad asset allocation strategy that's going to succeed in this new in this new era going forward. So that was kind of the the basis for uh, for me wanting to do this. And then and then Fernando brings just 
a totally differentiated skill set, having a background in machine learning that he can go into. And so, you know, between the idea that I think that we should, we have an expertise in real assets, we have a background there, and we also have a, a differentiated ability to uh, bring true data science into the, into the process and, and build our systems, processes, and models in a way, in a rigorous way that I know for a fact, having been at Ned Davis Research and worked in, in the independent research space, I know for a fact is, is something that's unique and differentiated in the market. So that's kind of the, the uh, putting you know, 12, 13 years of background into a, into a five minute synopsis from, from my perspective, but I'll let Fernando give his. Yeah, so just to go into my background a little bit. So I got my training undergrad in finance and economics and then did graduate studies in computer science, specializing in machine learning. Uh, started my career at Ned Davis Research and spent almost eight years there. Um, and I worked in their custom research department like Warren's talking about. So I basically did a lot of model building for our institutional client base, as well as like Warren said, contribute on the strategy side uh, whenever there was some strategy work that required some quantitative research, uh, I'd get involved there. So the tail end of those eight years involved a lot of collaboration working with Warren. And honestly, the germ, I think, of 314 Research came from that really good working relationship uh, that started at Ned Davis Research. I ended up leaving um, to join a VC-funded tech startup in the Bay Area about six years ago and uh, basically built out their data science team and worked on product features that involved AI and machine learning. So it was uh, <clears throat> kind of a different field from finance investing, but I've always had a foot in that world and wanted to uh, get back into it at some point. And Warren and I have kind of had this idea in the back of our head for a while. And in 2020, the stars kind of aligned and everything in the universe said, now's the time. So I'm really excited to be working with Warren again. It's, uh, it is a really great fusion of like uh, Warren being a great investment strategist and then having like the background that I have in, in ML and machine learning to kind of give him access to this tool set of data analysis uh, that I think differentiates our, our research. Well, we definitely have a long and uh, happy well, it depends who you ask. If you ask the Ned Davis side, they'd probably say I'm a pain in the ass. But a long and happy history of working with Ned Davis. We had a few of the folks there on the podcast. Uh, they even did all the charts for our very first book over a decade ago. And if you go back far enough, I even tried to get a job there. So you guys are infinitely more qualified than I am to, uh, to talk because you guys uh, eventually made it past the screening process, whereas I did not. So... Let's hear about uh, your new company. What is it you guys bring to the world new, different, uh, interesting? What are your capabilities? And let's hear the framework for how you guys think about the world. How do you approach markets and uh, all that jazz? Well, <laughs> really quickly before, just for one minute, because I think it's, a, I didn't really make it past the screening process as well. Uh, I. I ended up, uh, they give you that LPAT, the language programming aptitude test when you when you start out at Ned Davis. And that was totally, at the time it was foreign to me. And I I ended up uh, reaching out to the test maker, posing as a consultant and ask if I could get a copy of that test. I remember being so nervous before I took it. So yeah, I had to kind of do my own creative way to get in there as well. Um, but as far as how we, we look at the world, uh, you know, I, we can, I think it's the, the best way to kind of talk about it is to work through one of our models and how we build. Like we should start with the, the oil model, for instance. Uh, and that was the first one we released. And really you start with the idea. Can I, inter can I interrupt you and sure. just say the really only signal you need to know is buy oil when it's minus 30. That's, that's, that's that only is, happened once. <laughs> that's that is backtested really well, actually. Yeah, that's a good <laughs> Very high batting average there. That's why um, they pay me the big bucks. All right, keep going. Sorry. <laughs> no, I mean, uh, well, I mean, 
taking one step back, I think that's a great point is that our, our first goal is that having spent a lot of time in, in the industry, and once you start to build models and play with the data, what you realize is that, you know, it's really easy to fool yourself. We're not in this back test beauty contest business in this company for, for that's for sure. I mean, it, it, you've never seen a bad back test. You know, that's obviously kind of a meme that's out there in FinTwit right now. And there's a reason for it. And that's just, there's so much overfitting to history and, and to noise uh, in many cases. And so we're trying our best to be rigorous, rigorous in the front end when we ask the questions, like what are we, what are we trying to model right now and really define that in a discreet and precise way. So we set up our research question in a, in a, in a very discreet way. And then we answer it as best we can without fitting the noise. And so oil is a good case study. Uh, that's a, a, an area of the market that I had an extensive background in. And so we, we decided to kind of use that as our first pass. And, uh, you know, so I, I, I took the areas that I found that I knew to be important when we we're talking about crude oil. So we're, we look at uh, positioning in the futures market, the physical market, crack spread differentials, things like that, technicals. So price action obviously matters. Something that I've always said is you want to build your conviction off fundamentals, but you want to manage risk off of, um, uh, off of uh, price action and technicals. So you take these, you take these different areas of, of the market. And, uh, you know, I've, I go to Fernando and I say, Hey, here's what we watch in, in, in the oil market, these, these different regions. And, uh, you know, we can back test them and have a certain amount of logic and qualitative understanding of the market, but then he's going to provide that overlay of rigor when we're testing everything. And so he's, what we, for instance, what we do that's different and he can get into this is stitching together all these components, putting together uh, uh, when he does the back test for these different components, for instance, instead of just back testing and saying, you know, how did these signals fit to the full history? He'll do cross validation, do out of sample testing and things like that. And, uh, and he has access to, you know, just different models and algorithms that are we never had access to. You know, we were doing sticks and stones at Ned Davis Research in comparison to what we can do here. So having the power to do that without, without you know, but while being cognizant of what really matters and having a background in that space um, is, is, I think, a really unique combination. Jumping into that, um, it's really important when you're building a model and researching indicators that you set up the process so that it's possible to fail given a particular input. Uh, historically, like I've uh, been part of some model building processes where the goal is to build a model and it's a foregone conclusion that a model will emerge from the process. Mm. So it's really important. And like, we take that really seriously uh, that like I come to it from a perspective of, I've got all these different machine learning models that I can fit to data. Um, but I, I want to make, I want to set up a framework so that Warren can feed me these ideas. Uh, and like the most important part of machine learning is feature engineering, which essentially the best place to go to figure out how to engineer good features for a model is to domain experts. So with this oil model, Warren's playing the role of here's the set of indicators that are useful. Um, here's how I think they work. And that's another thing where ML is important. So ML gives you a huge zoo of potential uh, functional forms for how you map inputs to outputs. And, and what is like, what is some best practices when you're talking about like this whole process? Cause it's so seductive to um, get drawn into the output and the optimization to where you end up in this fantasy land of uh, you know, the, the, the fully optimized model, anything come to mind as things like, these are the best practices. These are the things we really want to think about when we're building these models. I think your, your scheme for how you're going to do out of sample testing is probably like the first step. And that's before you even have an idea of what inputs are going to help you predict an output. Uh, how, how are you going to cross validate things? So and you also have to think through uh, what kinds of uh, what kind of model are you looking for? 
Are you looking for a model that is trying to discover a truth about how markets work that exists consistently across an entire history? Or are you looking for a kind of model that picks up on trends that exist maybe in the last three years and you know didn't exist 15 years ago? Because you have all this historical data, but if you come to the problem saying, uh, yeah, this thing that's happening in the last three years, I'm gonna model that, then the historical data is no good no good to you. And the, the shorter lived the phenomenon you're trying to uh, build a model on is, the less data you have to prove that that theory is true. So uh, when it comes to ML, broadly speaking, you wanna be looking for uh, truths or theories about markets that uh, persist through time. Cause those are the, gonna be the ones that you can have the most confidence in. And okay. uh, I think coming into the model building process with an opinion on those things is really important. And it informs things like, how am I gonna do out of sample testing? There's no point in doing out of sample testing if you know the phenomenon you're trying to train on, you know, exists in one slice of time and ne has never existed before because you know what the answer is going to be. All right. So oil is going to the moon back in the day is 100, 200 back down to the zero negatives. What's kind of talk to us a little more case study. How yeah. the model, what, what are the inputs and what does it look like? Right, so to wrap up the, the oil model, we have inventories, technicals, positioning, and physical markets. So those are four big components that we're looking at. We more or less build a model for each one of those four components and then stitch them all together, right? And currently we're in this kind of, uh, it's, it's not a great uh, marketing angle, but the, the model is a, is a neutral and it's been neutral for, you know, the majority of this big rally here, the, the beginning part of the year. And, and as I've said, when I've talked to other folks on podcasts and interviews is, is that, and I think oil is important to understand for a lot of reasons this environment we'll get into. Um, that's been okay with me. You know, it's kind of how on, I've seen the market. You know, it's, it's uh, while we have these kind of the illusion of tightness when you look at the market. So inventories are drawing, right? And that's read through and the model is bullish and technicals look positive. You know, you're getting, you're, the, we're looking for uptrends and pullbacks and we've been getting those on our, on, on our signals. And the physical market has been like off and on looking good. And, and the Saudis have, have kind of sopped that up with their unilateral cuts, right? So you have these components that look good. On the other hand, we see futures positioning are, is kind of extended. We've seen a lot of optimism in the market. Our model likes to fade that. So when you net all this out, it's more or less a neutral signal. And that's how I would see the market. Um, really, the, the big overhang for crude oil and the, the really important takeaway and, and really the hardest thing to kind of, uh, I think, handicap when you're looking at the market at present is the massive OPEC spare capacity. So OPEC sitting on record spare capacity, and this, like I said, the cuts out of Saudi Arabia have really been the driver of the market. So here we are, we had Powell on the TV just like a few minutes ago today, um, everybody on Twitter, the consensus right now in my view is that you know inflation is here and that we're all experiencing inflation, lumber prices, used car prices, oil prices, right? And I think if you understand the oil market uh, and understand the amount of spare capacity and the reason why the market is rallied, which is really a supply side issue, this, the Saudis and OPEC removing supply from the market and being ultra disciplined, I, I think it may give you a different perspective of, of, um, of that inflation argument, right? It's, it's not so much that we are in a really tight market that's, you know, that where the, uh, where demand is outstripping capacity, what you're seeing is reduced capacity through OPEC. And, and quite honestly, it's not a sustainable posture for OPEC to hold this supply off the market for, for a sustained period of time. So how that oil comes back on the market is that X factor in, in when you're trying to uh, uh, make create a view for oil. And so we're neutral right now. And I'd say that the model has no way of understanding that, which, you know, is, it's understandable when you're thinking through just a quantitative model, but it's difficult from a human perspective as well to see how does this reopening and what's going on in India, for instance, how does that collide with all this OPEC spare capacity? So I think it's, you know, neutral is a fair position and that's, that's where the model is. And that's honestly where I'd be. 
Well, you know, it's interesting because you guys had a piece and I like your pieces because you have some great quotes in the beginning. Um, and one of the oil ones from from last year, you're talking about um, narratives, you know, and uh, the narrative, as you mentioned, certainly is what you were talking about, lumber, inflation, everything else. But it's it's always fun to look at the actual components of a model. And in, in looking at kind of y'all's oil story, uh, you have the curve indicator trading strategy that looks at, hey, is the, are the futures in backwardation? Is it flattening contango? Is it steepening contango? And then also you mentioned uh, the part of the, the role of CTAs where, um, you know, you fade them at extremes saying they're, they're positioned too high. So um, it sort of extracts the media what you hear all day versus actually some of the things that are going on behind the scenes and, and putting the weights on those as needed to come up with a signal. And as you mentioned, um, equally important not to have a position sometimes uh, than it is to just have one for the sake of talking about it. But uh, it's it's a fun, um, a fun model, certainly a big one, big dude, oil. And that's the, the tricky part of the environment we're in is you see backwardation, steep backwardation, a lot of commodities and oil in particular, which when you get that backwardation signal, what it's telling you, it, it's telling you that there's a deficit in the near term present on market conditions, you have a deficit in the market. So backwardation is going to call oil out of storage onto the market, onto the prop market. And, and it's a, it's a telltale signal historically that it's a tight, in bullish signal for the for prices but you know on when you look just beyond the backwardation in, in the physical market and that's a physical market component in our model you see this massive glut of, of spare capacity sitting there in opec and and to be honest like to put it back to what we do and why i think our process is the right way to approach a market like this is ultimately like you said we're not going to get caught in the narratives we're not going to we're we're you know, we're going to do, control our emotions and quantify these things that we know historically work. And then ultimately we'll discount them where, you know, if there's some kind of X factor sitting there, we'll discount that as well. But like at the end of the day, we're just going to add up our components and see what comes out. For now, the model's neutral and it makes sense to me when you see what's happening in the market. So uh, I don't see this as the beginning of an oil super cycle. I, I think that we could get one down the road. I definitely see the seeds being planted for that. But um, it's you're jumping the gun, I think, if you if you are calling for an oil super cycle when there's almost 10 million barrels of spare capacity in OPEC sitting on the sidelines. And this model, you know, anytime you throw together features that don't have any required correlation between them, you know, the model is going to be neutral when all the evidence isn't in favor of a certain position. But like one of the, the things that we try to do at 314 is like model explainability. We don't want black boxes. That's why we show the model in terms of its components. So if, for example, all you cared about was technicals, the model has had a really strong bullish technical reading for many, many months now, which is kind of the model's way of saying, hey, you know, the, the price action is looking really good, uh, but there's other things that go into the model. And it's all about, you know, building conviction uh, with these automated systems to the point where lots of things have to be in your favor for the model to make a, a correct call. Yeah. Um, traditionally, what is the defining parameters? Uh, is it price? Is it tend to be sentiment? Is it tend to be fundamentals? Is it tend to be positioning flows? Is there any sort of main lever that uh, sort of has its threads throughout most of your models across assets? I would say, um always price. So one of the, the kind of a uh, few like rules that I've developed over my career, just playing with data and, and doing analysis. One of the, one of the main rules is that if you're doing cross-sectional uh, analysis for different securities and definitely for different assets, you should lean heavily on price and not on fundamentals. And, you know, if you think through doing like factor analysis for, you know, the Russell 3000 or S&P 1500 or whatever, and you wanted to look at, I don't know, PE ratio or something like that, or, or price to book or something like that, you know, you, you have such a, like a, a 
heterogeneous group of stocks that, you know, these different business models, you know, are by their nature going to, to kind of, kind of shake out in a, in a certain way when you apply those fundamentals. And so like, just like the value factor, we talk about value stocks and really what that's done over time has become more or less like a, a financial energy, you know, type of sector bundle versus a, um, a true analysis of what's value, you know, because we have these intangible assets and things like that that don't make it into that equation. So when you're looking at across heterogeneous groups of stocks, heterogeneous asset classes, the one factor that you can't, that, that's always there and I think is always potential signal for you is price action. So we always have trend analysis in all of our models. Um, the other big one that we use, have is, is the real asset allocation model. So this is a 17 asset, our high level allocation model. And because of what I just laid out, we do not look at fundamentals in this model. We don't try and say, uh, you know, for instance, we have a gold model and the gold model looks at real interest rates and things like that, but we don't look at real interest rates because we're trying to compare gold in this case to gold versus value stocks versus tech stocks versus um, commodities versus REITs. You know, there are just too many diverse assets here. And so we stick to our proprietary trend analysis in, in, in that case. And in all cases, we, we definitely have that as a, as a component. Perfect. Let's hop over to uh, another one. Give me a preview what another model you guys have constructed is. Uh, feel free to pick and choose, or we could even hop right into the asset allocation. Anyone uh, pop into mind? I think that we should go. I think the real asset allocation model is a good one to, to talk about and kind of, uh, you know, exp give the idea of what, what we're talking about with um disregarding fundamentals and when you're talking about heterogeneous assets. And so we have, like I said, 17 assets in this model. And it's really, it really comes down to, if we're gonna decompose it, um, trend and correlation and volatility. And those are the three things we're looking at when we compare these assets. The, the highest level um, first pass is just a trend analysis. And we have a proprietary way of looking at trend. We, we can talk about in a bit, it's called trend breadth, but it's basically our way of judging trend across a multitude of timeframes. And that's a core component of almost every one of our systems. Um, and it's, it's really, a, a, I think it's a take, our take on momentum. And I think a more, a more robust way to measure momentum ultimately. So that's our first pass in, in our asset allocation model. And then we apply uh, hierarchical risk parity, which Fernando can get into, which is a concept coming out of ML, which more or less is a, is a portfolio optimization uh, tactic, which I think really uh, is a differentiator for this model. I don't know yeah, if you know, yeah. Fernando, you wanna get into that a little bit? So yeah, hierarchical risk parity is the approach that we use for the portfolio optimization side in the real asset allocation model. And it addresses the issues with mean variance optimization uh, because it trusts the correlation estimates less essentially than uh, mean variance optimization. So instead of using the correlation matrix directly to figure out a uh, weighting scheme, it first clusters all the assets into different clusters where similar assets are in one cluster and they compete for uh, capital allocation only with assets that are similar to them. And the model basically has this top-down view, kind of the way that uh, a traditional like uh, uh, portfolio manager would look at things. I've got equity bond within equity. I've got large cap, small cap within large cap. I have different sectors, et cetera. Um, uh, basically the hierarchical risk parity will build its own tree structure on the assets from the correlation matrix and then assign uh, weights so that risk is equally allocated across those different assets. Um, so the correlation matrix is just used at that first step to figure out the correlation structure of the markets. And then it's thrown away and you do your risk parity um, ap approach to efficiently allocate capital. And what you end up with is much more highly diversified portfolios. And um, more importantly, like a, an output that even if you tweak the correlation matrix pretty substantially, you end up with very similar outputs 
which is very different from traditional mean variance where you tweak that correlation matrix just a little bit and another asset will just pop up to a crazy high allocation because it's so sensitive to how, what is very hard to estimate. How, how much history are you looking at? Is this something that does kind of like a, a rolling shorter period or is it trying to ingest like a hundred years of history? How, how does the, what do you feed into this? We, we do rolling estimates because we're confident that we don't, you know, rely on the correlation matrix that much. We want the best estimates from the recent history uh, in, in the model. So we actually roll a multi-year window and estimate correlations, you know, from the recent data, which is cool because you have a model that is adapting. If one asset starts behaving like another asset, and you can imagine like we have both Bitcoin and gold in the model. So it's keeping track of the, the recent evidence about how assets move together uh, in order to figure out it's how it's going to allocate risk in the portfolio. Got it. Cool. Um, what are they saying now? What are you guys all in on Dogecoin or what? <laughs> yeah, um, we haven't gotten that uh, that far into the crypto space, but we we are. The model has been, uh, I'd say, the most controversial aspect of it has been an eight percent Bitcoin position, which it's held for really since inception. And uh, you know, this has been. I remember when we launched the company and, and had the, the initial we revealed the model. I, I have a, a buddy of mine who is a little bit older, but ran a hedge fund for many years, kind of traditional Wall Street guy. And he really pushed back on that. He's like, you know, I think that's um, that's not going to fly with most people have an 8% Bitcoin position. And again, we were like, hey, this is where the model, this is how the model has come down. And to, to kind of, we're, we're not really Bitcoin apologists. And we, I don't want to get into that almost religious debate around Bitcoin. But it's an uncorrelated emerging asset where there's a lot of money coming into it right now, right? And th those are the that's the basic you know facts on the ground as I see them. The thing that gets um, I think us interested as asset allocators and kind of quants is when you run through the little limited history we have. Uh, look at how uh, you know a, a broad portfolio, in this case our model portfolio, performed in 2018 when Bitcoin declined by. Uh, 75, 80%. And the, the model portfolio fell by five and a half percent. And that, that was a year where we came into that year with a, what I would say is a max Bitcoin position at 8%. And so the model was able to, it took its licks, but it scaled the position down because we had the trend component in the model. And then Bitcoin's lack of connection can fall apart, at least back in 2018, it could. Without impacting all these other assets, we could switch over into a more attractive asset mix and sidestep most of that uh, carnage. So, you know, we had an 80% decline peak to trough in Bitcoin back in that 2018 period, yet the model was only down 5.5%. 60-40 was down three, uh, roughly 3% that year. So, you know, we barely lost to 60-40 in this approach. And to me, that's the, the, power, that's the most powerful um, argument for Bitcoin is this, this, this kind of new diversifying asset, which, you know, allocators and quants are always looking for. And so um, that's that's one area the model likes. We've been overweight equities really since the uh, the end of last year, or through the middle of last year and into this year. And we've scaled that position back some. The average equity weighting in the, in the models around 38% historically. We're down to like 43 came into the year at like 51, 50% equity. So we've scaled that back. Uh, real assets still has a big weighting. The, the, the model likes Bitcoin, like I said, it likes commodities, and it's still kind of shunning bonds. The bond position's down at like 23%. So it's doing- Is, uh, is the equity scaling back, is that due to equities looking worse or simply other things looking better? Or what's, what's the kind of driving force behind that? I think it's been a little bit of uh, a rotation within the equity component. So we were really overweight small caps coming into the year. And then you saw kind of this really powerful small cap rally. And then uh, that kind of stalled out. So you saw a rotation out of small caps. Um, value got a little bit, but mostly it came out of small caps. And this might disappoint you, came out of emerging markets as well in the model. And, and uh, into really commodities and uh Real estate were the two spots that that picked up the flows uh, primarily in cash. There's a bit of a cash build in the model as well, which is 
again, something we've, we've pointed out before um, is that our cash component, if you're building a model, historically, you know, even at, at Ned Davis, like if you build a model, you have a switch where you're switching into cash. If you switch into T-bills and you're back testing against the falling interest rate environment, you're going to get this massive tailwind. I don't think people realize the kind of tailwind you get on your back test switching into T-bills in a falling interest rate environment. Well, that's not, again, this is an example of the past isn't going to look like the future. We're not getting that tailwind moving forward. So when we build our models and you switch into cash in our model, it's a static ones position. So, you know, it's, we're getting no uplift. It's a defensive risk management position. Um, and that's, that has been a place where the model has kind of moved some of those small cap and emerging market equity um, allocations into through the first four or five months of this year. Can we talk about the yield optimizer? Should we jump there? I just like the title of that. Sure. Yeah. Um, should we go yield optimizer. Do you want to talk about? Uh, should we just all buy a bunch of uh, beaten down energy bonds or what? What should we do? <laughs> yield optimizer is like yeah. Again, this is our uh, our take on how do you deal with the obvious dilemma that you have no no yield in the current environment, and so we took thirteen different assets, all income producing assets. And this kind of can pull into a few of our views on the market, which I think are, are, are unique to us. So we, we took 13 different income producing assets, including this would be things that might not be traditionally thought of as, as income producers like the energy sector. Um, and we, we, we pulled them into the same framework as we have for the real asset allocation model, trend breadth overlay, and then using our same optimizer and uh, we rotate around within that those those income producing assets to try and generate some yield, uh, and so this is kind of our our solution again at trying to. Uh, we, there's always clients and, and investors out there that want to generate income, and and so this is our our one way to solve that problem or get at solving that problem. Um, I think that the interesting part when we came out that model for a lot of folks is to see energy in there as an income asset. And this is something that, you know, back in April of 2019, the energy sector actually became the highest yielding sector in the market for the first time ever. And we've, we've it stayed there really until present day. And it's still about 100 basis points above the utilities uh, sector on yield. So this has become a, a, a high yield sector. And my, this is something that's kind of focused on the commodity and energy space that I was watching prior to the pandemic. And my interpretation is that the energy sector has become what I'd call a short duration investment, a short duration equity sector. So investors were tired of giving their money to management teams and, and trusting them to drill new holes and, produce, and, and fund CapEx. Instead, they're saying, we want that money back now or as soon as possible in the form of dividends. So it's forcing this discipline onto the energy space. And it's creating this, I think, in interesting pocket within, when you look out across all the different segments of the market, whether you're trying to create income or just find a diversifying, diversified portfolio, you now have kind of a short duration option there in the energy space. Uh, you can get duration. There's plenty of ways to, to get duration or long duration exposure in the market, whether it's big tech or bonds, um, anything with interest, really high interest rate sensitivity, uh, it's it's easy to get that long duration, but short duration is kind of uh, a little more tricky. So energy is, I think, it's giving you that yield and that it's reflected in the yield optimizer. And it's also giving you diversification and that it's got a different set of drivers than what's happening in other areas of the market, like big tech and in long duration types of uh, sectors. Yeah. I, uh, the beginning of the piece, you had a great quote from the Cormac McCarthy's The Road. And I just finished Blood Meridian. Cormac, the, the Road was one of the few books I've ever read cover to cover in one sitting. It says, man, we're starving now. And the boy said, you said we weren't. The man said, I said we weren't dying. I didn't say we weren't starving. And that's what it feels like. I mean, I know a lot of people, interest rates to them. I mean, obviously, it, I think it, it pays to think in a real terms, but uh, with junk bonds, and you know some of these hitting lowest levels ever 
you start to, you start to get a little you start to get a little nervous um, and uh, it's fun to look through your charts and hopefully uh, we get to post a bunch of these to the show notes listeners so uh, you uh, definitely check out medfavor.com forward slash podcast for uh, for some of the charts on some of these because they are uh, really insightful what should we hop over to next we should probably talk, about- talk inflation and our sure. day- inflation and what uh, I think that's the big uh, as I see it I think that's like a pretty that's the hot topic in the markets right now is you know is this inflation or is it are we jumping the gun and we wrote yeah. uh, I, I, our view is that it's not inflation basically interesting what is it then well I mean I think that I mean I have this conversation with friends and, and kind of colleagues all the time it's uh Number one, I, let me just say, we are kind of trend followers by nature. We're not trying to be contrarians just for the sake of being, and I, and I feel like that's not like some kind of like meta contrarian thing to admit that we're not going to be contrarians because everyone wants to be a contrarian. Everyone wants to buy the thing that's down and sell the thing that's up. It's like, it's the, that human nature is the way I see it at least. And a part of that, or at least some aspect of that, I think is this, uh, desire to see inflation before everybody else and to kind of pull anecdotes out of the world and say, aha, here's inflation, you know, and then also, of course, criticize the Federal Reserve, um, which is kind of like, you know, you get, you get a lot of brownie points for that these days, it seems like, or at least get a lot of retweets and likes and things like that. So uh, those things kind of all have conspired in my view to make, that's really the consensus view, at least in, 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 in some circles that we are inflation is here. It's not that um, it's not something to worry about in the future. It's like, we're, we're seeing lumber prices. We're seeing semiconductor shortages where, you know, used car prices are going up. Um, you know, there's, there's a lot of different examples that you can point to oil, oil prices, break evens, whatever. And I, I think that's ultimately, those are all supply chain issues are mainly supply chain issues. You can trace almost every one of those instances back to something on the supply side, some disruption on the supply side. Um, and quite frankly, the way we look at it is not to try and we're, we don't win a award for, um, for, find, for, for finding the most interesting uh, anecdote that proves inflation. Like we are going to stick to the, to the metrics that the Federal Reserve is watching because ultimately that's where, that's what matters is that the Fed moves quicker than is consensus. So we look at the CPI, we break the CPI down. And what we see is this massive dispersion within the CPI. So the the median correlation of every, all more than 200 CPI component parts to the CPI is now negative for the first time ever going back to the 1950s. So that tells you that we're going through this weird period of the massive dispersion within the economy where you're seeing pockets of inflation living alongside pockets of deflation, or at least ostensible inflation and deflation. Uh, and, and really when you see that dispersion, and then you see, you can kind of look at the slack in the economy, the output gap, labor participation rate, unemployment rate, all these things, and then to go back to the first part of the conversation, where we talked about nine to 10 million barrels of spare capacity in the oil market, what you see really when you start stitching this all together is a world that actually, you know, the Fed is correct, I believe, that we this is a supply chain issue. There is a lot of spare capacity out in the, in the system. And the bottom line is adjusting monetary policy at this point to try and, you know, stamp out these anecdotal um, inflation fears would be premature and probably ineffective in my view. Um, and I don't think that that's a real popular viewpoint as much as you know, everybody, it's, it would be a lot easier and a lot cooler for me to come on the Med Favor podcast and be, you know, just like lay into the Fed and like get my get brownie points for everybody for that. But I, that's just not how we see it. We see it as a supply chain issue with uh, a lot of slack in the economy at this point still. And so, um, as investors, that tells us that the Fed is going to stay on the sidelines for a while. Um, and, and by our estimations, given the fact that they said they're going to let inflation run hot for a while, and then bottom line, as you look at their 2% target, we've done some work on where would break-evens have to go 
you know, if we saw break evens like five year break evens go to, um, you know, three to 4%, then you might start worrying, but we're still, we're still a hundred basis points away in our estimation, whether you're looking at two year, five year uh, break evens before the Fed starts getting nervous um, uh, on structural inflation. So I, I, all those things come together and we say, look, there's the Fed's not going to end this party anytime soon. You know, a lot of people, I think, as part of this, you you hear a lot of uh, surprise that the shiny metal is not at, I don't know, five or 10,000 or something right now, gold. How do you guys think about gold? You call it the chameleon asset. What's the, uh, what's the approach and how, uh, how are you guys thinking about it right now? I, I see the same, you know, it's very similar to how we did the oil model where we have a four component of model first off that sits on this is this is the the sterile answer you know we have you know a four component model the four components are trend positioning real interest rates and asset allocation attractiveness we wrote an entire pub on that a report on that where we we outline each one of those factors and like kind of how we stitch them together and that's again kind of relying on fernando's expertise and our ability to cross validate all those all those components but the reason we call it the chameleon asset is because when you really start testing gold, it, these are, it goes through different regimes where different things matter. And it's really hard to find a stable set of indicators at, if, across a long arc of history that call the gold market. Um, and so that brings us to today, like why is gold not reacting to everything? And, and you know, I could point to in our model would say real interest rates, but basically we've had CPI and, and, and inflation measures more or less pinned, I mean, that's gonna change. So we'll see how that reads through the model, but they've been pinned, whereas nominal rates have just skyrocketed straight up from August 4th onward. But an interesting thing, when you look at gold, it topped out on August 6th. So gold tops out August 6th, rates bottom on August 4th. It's pretty easy to me, you don't wanna overthink it, that gold is reacting to this rise in interest rates. and. A, Again, it brings in this duration argument. Gold, in my view, is an infinite duration asset. So it is ultra interest rate sensitive. And that, I think, is the most powerful force operating in this market right now. Is, is as the reopening comes closer, and that thing that it's just going to be a force we've never seen before, it is setting the table across, uh, across assets and how assets are performing relative to each other. And so gold is caught up in that. It's an infinite duration asset. And I think it's it's having a hard time moving higher with rates uh, skyrocketing like this. Gold, uh, more than any of the assets, well, excluding crypto, probably elicits a binary response. People are either total gold bugs or absolutely hate it. Usually there's not a whole lot in the middle. Other asset classes, I don't feel like, um, you know, really generate that sort of, uh, vitriol but crypto seems to be in the same same yeah. ballpark um what else have we talked about guys it seems like we've gone all the way around the world uh is this value trade going to continue what about the u.s dollar the u.s dollar seems to be plumbing the lows from 2018 and 2021 are you guys pointing towards further weakness there or is that uh is that story played out uh you know again we have a, our model for the dollar is is highly relying on trend breadth. And so that's a concept we haven't really talked about, but it's it's a proprietary technical uh, indicator we've created. It, it lives in a lot of the indicators we've made. So the bottom line, I give you the, I don't want to bury the lead on the dollar. The dollar model went from a buy to a neutral here recently. So it's another neutral model for us. I think we're in this transition point. And I think, as you point out, we're at the, the dollar is close to long-term support. And so if we break that, that 89.90 level, you know, that's, I think that's going to be a pretty important tell for, for uh, how things go. And the fact that if, if you ask me just without looking at the model, what I think is going to happen, I think we end up breaking those levels and the dollar is weaker over the longer term. And that's as a result of the fact that government spending as a percent of GDP has increased by 50%. So we went from basically a long-term spend of 20% of GDP up to about a third of GDP. And that's gonna be, I think, a structural shift higher. It's one of the themes that we've kind of laid out for our clients is how to play this structural shift higher in, in uh, US federal government spending. 
Uh, and we've outspent almost every country combined uh, in stimulus for the pandemic. So I do think the dollar is going to suffer ultimately from, from that kind of fiscal spending. But at this point in time, from a timing perspective, our model is still neutral right now. So we're kind of at this in this transition point in the dollar here and now. Um, again, the big driver of that model and in a lot of ours is it's, uh, something called trend breadth. And I'll give you a quick run rundown, but I think Fernando can probably explain how we're able to uh, use the, a crunch big data problems in a way that other firms aren't in, in this trend breadth is an example of that. So what we, what I did at NDR for a long time was I would create these different indicators. I looked at where I'd run regression trend lines through time series and measure the slope and the change in the slope of these regression trend lines and, and derive different signals from those. And I always wanted to do just like a whole, uh, be able to look at it from so many different time frames. So when we got together, Fernando and I came up with this trend breadth concept where we were running linear regressions across dozens and dozens of time frames for each asset and then deriving information from each one of those, each one of those regression trend lines. So we can look at is the slope positive or negative? Are we, you know, what's the residual for each one of those uh, regressions? Um, the percentage of time frames that we are positive or negative and how that number is changing. So a second derivative. So there are tons of, there's tons of information we can derive from just that one indicator. And then when we're, when we do cross sectional comparisons, it allows for some, I think a really fine detailed uh, look at the trend of an asset in comparison to another one. And so if you're comparing it through traditional momentum where you do like one in like a 12 month momentum with minus one month momentum, and even if you're blending that with a six month momentum, you only are looking at like four data points ultimately to derive your signal there where trend breadth is looking at every using every single data point for, uh, for the last, whatever your look back period is, you go back two, three years and be calculating the trend lines all the way back there. Um, and so it, it, to me, it's much, it's much more sensitive and it scales in and out of positions much better than your traditional momentum factor while still picking up on some of the same dynamics. And this is an example, I think, too, where the tool set for machine learning kind of helps in developing new indicator ideas. Because like when Warren talked to me about you know, I, uh, I find uh, trend lines, you know, across certain um, time periods to be useful for its strategy work. And, he's, and then we were talking about, okay, what do we want to do here? And it's like, well, let's try medium term and longer term. And then we were like, you know, maybe we should incorporate some mean reversion and look at the shorter term as well. And basically, as we were going through this exercise, uh, what we were doing resonated with this uh, concept with this algorithm from machine learning world called random sample consensus, which is all about taking subsets of your data set and uh, running regressions against the subsets and then making a conclusion about the percentage of those subsets that coincide with a particular conclusion. So like in our case, trend breadth is basically saying, uh, let's run a ton of trend lines against uh, a bunch of different slices of historical data and what percentage of those would say that we are currently in an, in an uptrend in this asset. And that's essentially in a nutshell what this trend breadth concept is. So it's, uh, it's a cool example of how that ML toolkit can kind of, uh, when Warren talks to me about uh, strategy work, certain things vibrate in ML world that can come in and help us come up with some novel uh, techniques. I've always been a big uh, fan and proponent and interest in the in the breadth world. Uh, I find that part fascinating. It often, in my mind, kind of signals perhaps some areas that uh, may be overlooked or it's hard to, you know, certainly argue um, kind of some of the, the results that it's spitting out. You guys do talk about stocks individually a little bit as far as lists. I saw some for uh, talking about reopening and some ideas. How, how do you think about individual securities uh, as a part of your overall offerings? Yeah, I mean, uh, so the, broadly speaking, again, we've been bullish and like we said, we kind of dialed back our equity exposure, but we're still overweight equities and we're still more or less bullish. Um, within our recommendations, the big trades we were we saw unfolding from a macro perspective last year was 
the reopening trade. Uh, obviously, that's kind of consensus. Um, and, and we were recommending uh, stocks that I would say were the, the tip of the demand spear. So we, we had some airline plays, um, mainly domestic-based uh, routes, uh, hotels, and oil refiners. And so for the most part, we, we closed those out uh, here in April. Uh, most of those positions have run pretty well. And I think that really what you're, the, not that the reopening is not going to be, uh, you know, a, a huge boom, but I, I mean, these airlines are now, you know, their enterprise value is 25% above what it was when we were recommending, la recommending it last year. So a lot's baked in. So the expectations are baked in. So the, the, the big theme we've been digging into outside of our quant models, our macro theme would be entrenched interest. And so, again, going back to the government spending that we've seen jump up here, uh, we, you know, we saw there's a lot of notes and it's kind of traditional Wall Street to go through and look at the, the, the infrastructure spending bill, for instance, or the stimulus package and try and look at how we're backwards from how will this bill help certain companies, you know, like where will the money go and then trace those, those bouncing balls to in that way. And I think that's a valid way to do it, but it still is so early to us. Uh, it's, I think a better way to do it right now and to get positioned and probably just as effective even at the end of it is to just find those companies that are already doing business with the federal government. So you have this belief our, on our side, our thesis is that government spending is going up structurally in the next few years. And so how do you play that? And our recommendation is uh, entrenched interests. And this was a list of stocks that we came up with um, using kind of two different, two different routes to get to this answer. So the first route we did is we went through the largest contractors, company, publicly traded companies that contracted within the last five years with the, with the federal government. And we compiled that list. And then I turned to Fernando and I had him basically use some of his ML techniques to work through the company filings and find uh, companies that were, uh, highly exposed to uh, the federal government, uh, renewing contracts, stimulus, things like that. So I don't know if Fernando, you want to describe that side of, uh, of the entrenched interest analysis. Yeah, I think it's just a, a cool example of the kind of stuff that uh, natural language processing, if it's in your toolkit, we can do something like scan through thousands of annual filings and uh, come up with a set of phrases that we're going to look for that are basically hallmarks of companies that do business with the federal government and do a kind of a, a factor analysis that is pretty unique. And we, I kind of like, we've talked in the past about wanting to do more uh, along these lines, but imagine if you could come up and do factor analysis on particular phrases that appear in annual filings or in earnings calls, and you could build a portfolio of sentences, you know, <laughs> and do analysis on that. It's a really cool area of research that we kind of want to explore. And this is kind of like the most basic implementation of it. Um, just looking for companies that if you look at their Salesforce leads database, you know, the federal government is on there and they'll hit them up when they see that they're flush with cash. It's a standard startup thing to do as well. You, you watch for who just raised funding and then you go and try to congratulate them on their funding and then try to sell them your software. Uh, so I have a feeling that these companies, you know, are going to be uh, saying, oh, you guys want to spend on infrastructure. Well, we've got some infrastructure <laughs> ready for you here. You know? Yeah, yeah. That's funny. Um, so how do you guys work with clients? Uh, tell us the business model or is, are you um, targeting investment advisors, individuals, institutions? Uh, is it a subscription feed? Do you guys do custom work? What, what's the business look like? Yeah, uh, we are an institutional research provider. And so uh, we work with... Uh, you know, as stated, institutions, asset managers, RIAs, hedge funds, family offices, um, and, and we're a, you can more or less subscribe and get our research. You can get our core models, and they update daily on our website. All of our our library of charts on our website, and we publish weekly, so you get a, a weekly report in different formats. Uh, and then we do have uh, everything from you know, fully custom models to what model portfolios, which are, you know, kind of a, a tweak here or there of our uh, current model offering. And so we have 
clients who are following and creating their own version of the real asset allocation model. So they can put their own stamp on what we're doing. So we give them this framework and then they can go in there and, and pull the levers that they want to, to kind of make it fit their, their benchmark. So they want we have clients that, Hey, we want infrastructure in there. We want certain healthcare components in there to be represented or not represented. Uh, ESG mandates are, you know, change things in ways that you wouldn't really even imagine at a certain time. So they might want now a, a, something changed on that front and we can present that for them and, and, and build that kind of custom version of what we've already kind of demonstrated to the market. So that's kind of the, the, the basic uh, the business model. Is now. it mostly advisors or is it big institutions? Is it a mix? It is right now. Here, so I'll be told it's everybody likes to have like, you know, what did you learn from starting a business type of advice or what, what kind of, um, so five months into this business, what have you learned? And when I launched this, the, the idea of, and I, one of the, what I sold Fernando on is that, you know, I think this RIA side of the market is, is kind of underserved and there there's money gravitating in that space. And so we want to price this in a way that they can, it, they can, uh, utilize it, but obviously we want to have high level, really high level institutional research. Uh, and when we launched really, I guess maybe our research resonated more with, with the high level institutions less than the RIA. So we had a lot of bigger hedge funds and asset managers um, sign up and we are working with RIAs and we have, we have some, but I expected them to just be coming in in droves. And what I'm learning is that's a different it's a different client than a, than a hedge fund, for instance. And so, you know, there's trust that needs to be built in a little bit more um, ex explanation of what you do and how you fit into the market. So we're, it's, an, it's an education process, really. And, you know, that's what, the, what we're, we're doing right now. But I, I would certainly hope to, to have a lot of RIA clients um, in the years ahead. What's the um, dialogue been like with the clients? Um, you know, is, is the back and forth conversation, anything in particular on their mind that surprised you? Or are you like, dude, everyone will not stop asking about ESG or Canvas <laughs> or Dogecoin, whatever it is. Is there uh, sort of a, a, a narrative that everyone's interested about or um, worried about? Yeah, I mean, Bitcoin is like, it blew me away the amount of Bitcoin interest early on that like even just saying oh, we're starting the firm, are you going to be covering Bitcoin? And, uh, and I do think there was this, it, we passed this point of um, this phenomenon where, you know, it was careerist to consider having Bitcoin exposure. And I, I do believe we've passed into where we flipped it. So it's now kind of career risk if you don't have Bitcoin exposure and that nervous energy is coming back from a lot of folks who, really neglected that, that space for many years and are now kind of trying to play catch up and, and figure out what's, what's going on. So there's a lot, there is a lot of energy, uh, unsurprisingly, around, around Bitcoin and uh, cryptocurrencies. And we're working on a standalone Bitcoin model right now. Uh, but again, we, we're taking our time. Because as Brian said, we're not just going to throw something out there. We're taking our time and trying to build it right. And this is a, a pretty young market. So you want to do it right. So Bitcoin's big, and then the uh, inflation debate and, and, and oil and energy is always top of mind. I think folks are wondering, uh, is, is, you know, are we going to have a huge spike in oil prices? And, you know, and that's, that's come back as well. Um, as you look to the horizon, as you build out your business, what uh, anything on the brain that you guys are uh, any reports you're working on? I mean, these reports are so thorough. It's uh, it's a lot of fun to read. What uh, what are you guys diving into? Can you give us any peeks behind the curtain that you haven't uh, published yet? I think yeah. Can... Go ahead, Fern. I was just going to say, I think you can expect a lot more work on uh, our stock selection system. Like our latest report, we just put out basically what we consider version one, which is taking trend breath kind of as we've talked about it and used in our other models and just done a typical like factor back test of the trend breadth system and found some encouraging results. But we think there's a ton of value to be mined in digging deeper into that and uh, doing some like portfolio optimization uh, on our stock portfolio. 
to, to come up with some interesting uh, techniques for figuring out how to improve on an equal weighting of the stocks that rank high on trend breadth. So that's kind of an open, uh, exciting area for us that we want to dive into more. Yeah, I would say I echo that. I mean, that was going to be one of my top of mind uh, areas that we're digging into. Uh, like I said, we're, we're working on a Bitcoin model kind of in uh, tandem with that. And, and I think that this, uh, in me, as I, to me, as I think about it strategically, this regime definition, uh, this problem is something that uh, I, I'm, we're doing some more and we're trying to apply machine learning to. And it sounds kind of opaque, but like you have this kind of, everyone wants to fit each period that you're into, into a, like kind of a, a, a simple clean cut regime, you know, this is, this is, we're in reflation right now. We're in uh, deflation or some, or, or stagflation or, you know, different kind of simple quadrants of, uh, of the business model. And so we're kind of, we're, I don't want to get too far into it because we haven't published the work yet, but we're trying to put our own spin on and, our, and define those, those different environments uh, in maybe a different, more flexible way but um, and, and hopefully more accurate in, in something that fits onto, I think what's, what's happening right now. Cause I don't, like I said, this is such a uh, novel time that you can get your signals crossed really easily if you're trying to just fit this period of time into those kind of historic analogs uh, without thinking it through it very deeply. So that's something yeah. I'm, I'm thinking through as a strategist. Yeah, there's definitely, uh, I, I feel like, um always uncharted waters, right? Like that's the excitement of our business is every day brings uh, something, well, in, in the last two years, weirder, I would say, um, and, uh, and new as well. Uh, to the extent you guys have done uh, some on your own, what's been your most memorable investments? You guys get to pick who goes first, good, bad, in between, anything coming to mind? Um, okay, I'm going to give my bad one because I'm not going to call the person out that, 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 um, that, because I somehow I always remember my bad investments better, my, my good ones. So, uh, I bought a, when I first started investing, <laughs> this little, uh, NAS, I think it was called NASTEC. It was supposed to be a nasal delivery system for, for insulin, I believe. And, uh, somebody who, someone was pumping it that's still around in the financial media at the time. And I was just like, uh, in law school, I threw a few bucks in it and got, uh, went all the way to zero. And that's the only time I've ever wrote an investment to zero. So it sticks out in my mind, uh, but it was a good lesson. And it's uh, scared me off of biotechs for the most part. I mean, that um, went back to the nineties. Inhale therapeutics was, uh, I remember like one that was doing that God, 20 years ago, at least talking about it. Uh, I have no idea what happened to them listeners, but it may bring back some memories. Scars usually, scars usually leave a mark. That's for sure. Yeah, you learn a lot more from your mistakes than your victories. Um, and that was like, for me, I didn't do any kind of traditional business um, school or anything like that. So really just losing money when it was, when it meant enough to me, but it wasn't really any money was, uh, was a good lesson. And uh, a good investment, you know, I think it's nice to be right for the right reasons. Uh, I bought a lot of um, uh, Williams Company last year at the, at the lows and that thing's gone up uh quite a bit and so it was i was right for the right reasons i just knew that that was a screaming cheap stock and so i still own really most of it so uh riding that thing with like a seven percent dividend yield right now so that was a, that's been a good investment i guess um seven percent dividend yield gone are those days that's pretty uh rarity in this world i think most people are happy with about two s and right. not even two anymore i don't think i think it's one something that's right. That's right. So that's, those are two that pop off and hopefully we'll be talking in, you know, three, five years and the best investment will be, you know, starting 314 research. So that's the, yeah. That's the, so sweet. I've got, a, I've got a good and a bad one just in recent history last year during the turmoil, I dramatically increased equity exposure in my <laughs> discretionary portfolio about a week and a half before the bottom. So that's like the good one. Right. And then, uh, ramped it right back down towards the end of the summer <laughs> thinking yeah. that okay this is enough <laughs> so that's kind of the the good and the bad all in uh, in one year gotta pay more attention to your breath rankings that's for sure 
Yeah, it's good to it's good to have a model. I mean, that's yeah. actually the, the moral of the story. It's good to have a model, not get skittish. Um, what's the uh, what's the best place to find you guys? How do we uh, keep up with what you're doing? If somebody wants to check out some reports, maybe sign up. Where do they go? How do they find you? What do they do? You can uh, 314research.com is the site. Uh, you can enter your email and get uh, trial access. Um, you can reach out to me on Twitter or to 314research on, on Twitter. Uh, and uh, we're pretty easy to find. So if you reach out, we'll be responsive. Awesome. Gentlemen, Fernando, Warren, thanks so much for joining us today. Thank you, Mev. I really appreciate this. Yeah, thanks for having us on.